words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Dallas, in this session, we're working on hearing God in the context mm -hmm. of life, the life that God gives, the uncreated life, and our lives as we learn to live them in context with this right. life. Now, I want to take you way back, 40 years ago, when you were teaching a little ragtag group of folk and taking us through the book of Acts, and you and the Spirit working together, together came up with this sentence. I mean, helping us see how Acts fits in the larger picture. Mm -hmm. The sentence was, the aim of God in history is the creation of an all-inclusive community of loving persons with God himself at the very center of that community as its prime sustainer and most glorious inhabitant. Remember that? I remember that. I'm glad you wrote it down because uh, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I couldn't say that in one sentence if my life depended on it. Well, it was a wonderful sentence, and, and it, it kind of captured that whole sense and the flow into how the book of Acts fits into that. But then, of course, you're not just teaching the books of Acts. You were teaching the whole Bible and the whole of our lives and how it all fits together. Yes. Then years later, we were working on a Bible project, and you came up, or you worked with, I mean, we were, we were struggling with this whole uh, concept of the unity of the Bible, which, you know, when you, theologians, oh, they, yes. oh man, they go into, yeah. uh, tie themselves into all kinds of knots about this. Big seminary topic. I know it. And, and you came up with that phrase, the with God life as the unity of the Bible. It was just like, whoa. So now, talk with us a little bit about that in terms of a kind of sweep of holy history. Of, of uh, We, we want to go from Genesis to Revelation mm -hmm. uh, in about uh, four and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. on, uh, <laughs> Ought to be possible. <laughs> the, the speed of the Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> on the with God life. Yes, that's right. Well, um, you see from the very beginning that God places human beings uh, in positions of responsibility. Mm. And we actually have no way of discerning the degree of responsibility and power that Adam and Eve had in the garden. Uh, but it was uh, a position of great responsibility because it clearly says in the first chapter of Genesis that we had to take charge of the fish and the, mm -hmm. all the other living things. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the green ethic that we talk about today is right there in Genesis 1 and obviously much bigger than we can manage. Indeed. Uh, I, I would have trouble just with the trout. Yes. I wouldn't know how to handle them. <laughs> I must say. Uh, and there's a lot of other things. And it winds up with creeping things. Yes, so indeed. I, things. I don't know if I want to... Well, maybe... <laughs> You know, maybe if you only had to, if you had to speak to them, right? You know, yes. Uh, as yes. Uh, Agnes Sanford uh, created by her, speaking, she could tell the bees to go away, and they would go I away. Know. I, I, I like know. I like that way of working with it. I, I'm, I'm. For so it. it must have been a great response. The mosquitoes have never been very. Uh, I think they must have got here them. after the fall. <laughs> <laughs> But in any case, it was, a, it was a situation where there was great responsibility and great power. And uh, interestingly, distance. Mm. And this is crucial to the whole story. And when we look at the woeful path of human history, well, we, we wonder where is God? And I think the answer is, well, uh, the real question is, where is man? Mm -hmm. And he's away from God. Mm -hmm. And that's his choice. Mm -hmm. God hasn't left him alone, but now uh, you see God showing up in the garden. And apparently they were on very friendly terms at that point. But still, he would come and visit and mm -hmm. then obviously give them some that's distance. Crucial. A little space. Right. And, and, and that, that sense of God 
when man disobeys, God hiding himself from us so that that's, we can yes. hide from God. That's exactly right. And that's crucial to the plan of God in human history to bring that community out of human history, which is almost nothing compared to time. Yeah. It's extremely short. Uh, and who knows what else he has in mind in this great universe that he's created. But there's this project uh, of uh, bringing that community of love indwelt by God out for obviously cosmic and eternal purposes. So you see God giving distance. After the fall, he was still coming around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He had this little chat with Cain right. and then uh, Enoch. Mm -hmm. He walked with God. Noah, Noah. found favor yep. Yep. with God. And so now for a while, it's hard to track that until you come to Abraham. And it's very interesting that Abraham is the first one who is called the friend of God. Yep. And so a different kind of relationship is now developing because instead of just having an individual here or there, we have a family. A family. Okay. A natural unit. So we've gone from the individual to the family. Right. And uh, this is God's way of being more fully in the human condition mm -hmm. without standing over it. Mm -hmm. And so, when you look at Abraham's life, it's very interesting to watch the ins and the outs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But God has now a covenant. And uh, the covenant is with a family, and the family grows into a nation. Right, people. Yep. A nation with, with as yet no place to be. Ah. And, uh, and then the events of the Exodus and the life of Moses you see an increasing with God presence in the world. Ah. And God is saying to Abraham, through you and through your seed, all the families, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And the tabernacle then becomes part of that with God That's right. sensibility. That's right. It, is, it gives a focal point for human beings to locate God in relationship to themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now that really is crucial to this whole story because mm -hmm. even today, you know, you ask, where is God from here? Right. <laughs> Wherever here he is. <laughs> and uh, for living, that's a, a crucial question. And you see in the spiritual life of people at the present, overcoming distance as they experience is, is really a major uh, project. But uh, the way uh, of preparation for dealing with that, which we now know through Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God as he brings it to earth in an available form, mm -hmm. that's prepared by centuries mm -hmm. through which God is with people who aren't necessarily doing what he wanted. Right. And so they, we go through a period after coming out of the Exodus, God is present with the people of Israel through judges that are raised up. And the people of Israel finally say, we don't want to do this anymore. We need a king. We need a king. And God says, eh, it's not a good idea. And so he says to the last of the judges, Samuel, now tell them what's going to happen. This king you want is going to make your life miserable. Mm. And uh, sure enough. And that statement to Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're That's rejecting, right. They're rejecting me. me. One of the most profound statements in all of this with God story. Uh, but he didn't reject them. Yep. He said, okay, we'll work this out. And then he uses the monarchy mm. in many, many ways. One was to establish a different kind of presence uh -huh. in the priest and in the prophets. Uh -huh. And the prophets remain outsiders. Mm -hmm. Even if they're insiders in some sense, like Isaiah and Jeremiah were, they were outsiders in terms of how they were operating with God. Mm -hmm. In relationship to... That's yep. in relationship that was oppositional often. Right. Which, that's why so many of them got killed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Is, uh, they, but that was God's way of being with them. I remember you once saying to me, because we were kind of out in the sticks, 
the prophets get killed, but only in Jerusalem. Right. That's where, <laughs> that's where, that's where you go, go to get killed. And so we went with the movement from individual to family to nation. nation. Even identified in terms that God didn't want the identification. Right. Right. But now then, in that period, you have the building of the temple, temple. you have okay. the formulation of the law and mm -hmm. carrying that forward, mm -hmm. so that when the nation gets smashed, which it does. Right. Um, so then exile. exile, but God is still That's the with key. Them. That's the key, is they found out that there was a God in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of heaven now begins to intrude. All right. Not as something far away, but right. something, they, they, they went to, to Babylon and they thought, God isn't here. And lo and behold, he was there. God's here. Right. right. <laughs> and he's here. And you have these wonderful stories. Daniel is so magnificent. That book is so magnificent because it is always bringing in, there is a God in heaven. Yep. Oh, you have a dream? We mm -hmm. can do something about that. The God there is heaven. a God in heaven. Yep. Right. Yep. And, and the first heaven in, in Hebrew cosmology is the atmosphere. That's right. That, us, yeah. That's exactly right. Uh, it is not far away. Uh, as I like to say, it goes all the way down to your socks. And, uh, <laughs> that's, that's the first heaven. And uh, uh, now that's what they're learning is the presence of God in the surrounding atmosphere. Then when you look back, you see how that happened over and over and over in the history of Israel. Mm -hmm. The wonderful passage in Deuteronomy about uh, the everlasting arms mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is actually a statement about God's presence in the atmosphere. Yep. And uh, so this is the learning that goes on. And uh, of course, there's a And lot then there's the restoration period. And God's with them in that. I mean, the, the Nehemiah story and right. all of that. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, the big deal here is they don't have a government. Mm. God is dealing with them through Cyrus and the Babylonian and then the Medes and the Persians and all of that. And that is such an incredible lesson because now they learn we don't have to have a government to have a God. Right. And, and so to live with God. To live with God. We can That's live right. with God without the government. Right, and, and incidentally, without a very impressive temple. Exactly. Because what they had in the second temple was pretty grimy. <laughs> it really was. And, but there was a lot of learning there because God was still present. Now, the Shekinah did not return to the second mm. temple. Mm. as it was in the first temple. That is the visible presence of God. Did not return, but that was pulling them forward so that by the time John the Baptist shows up on the scene and he says, well, you know, uh, rethink what you're doing because the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the heavens is right here. Right here, okay. And that lays a foundation and he establishes the connection between the old prophetic tradition and the new one with Jesus. And Jesus then becomes the embodiment of a with God life. That's right. He is the Shekinah in person. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And he returns to the temple. And of course, there's a future to that, but we can't go into but it. But now the, the life of Jesus is so important because it is helping us now, Catch a picture right. of this with God life. That's right. And so that's Emmanuel. Right. Emmanuel. He is it. And uh, he comes in the form of a person. And now mm -hmm. a face is put on God. Mm -hmm. And it is the face of Jesus. I love the idea of the great doctrine of the New Testament of the Christ likeness of mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. That God is like Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so the Gospels as the cotton patch version says, that Jesus is tops overall. That's right. That's gives, us a, gives us a clarity about that's right. the with God life. But then that moves into the church, the book of Acts. Well, that's the, the continuing epistles. incarnation is the church. Uh -huh. And uh, the way that forms is he, of course, says now we're dealing with the Jewish people. They're the ones that have been prepared for this. Right. And they are the ones through whom the Abrahamic blessing comes to all of the earth and all the families of the earth. 
Right. And so now you get a uh, you get a body of people animated by the presence of the Spirit of God, uh, enabling them to live like God. And right. wonderful phrase in Ephesians 5, be ye followers of God as dear children. Mm -hmm. Such a wonderful way of, uh, you watch a little child imitating their yep. parents. Yep. And, um, so God has become accessible in Jesus, and a body has been formed. And a body formed, that is this community of loving persons with God at the very heart of that right. community, and of course yeah. Acts tells that story. It does indeed, and, and you see it up to today, Richard. You find people spread out in history and in time and place. Uh, they don't look like there's a lot of them, but they aren't actually for show and tell. <laughs> and uh, God doesn't necessarily right. uh, set them on exhibit, but you have uh, these wonderful people, Mother Teresa, Dorothy Day, Bonhoeffer, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Man Alive. I, I love Bonhoeffer especially in my context because in the academic world, people just can't avoid him. Yep. No, oh, it's astonishing. Uh, and. Uh, it's so funny to watch them kind of twist and turn to get around his devotion to Jesus, which is just the whole deal for him. When I was a teenager, it was cost of discipleship mm -hmm. that kept me mm -hmm. because I couldn't find it anywhere, mm -hmm. but I would, and I have this old tattered copy <laughs> that mm -hmm. I would read over and over, as this is a high school kid, mm -hmm. because it gave me a picture mm -hmm. of and then, of course, life together. Right. Now, in the Bible, but this, this projects on into the future. That's right. And the blow-up <laughs> is on the day of Pentecost. Yep. Because that is the point at which everyone comes from all the nations around. Yep. And they are imprinted and, in many cases, inhabited by this God that came in Jesus through His Spirit now, and they spread out across the world and take that message out, completely non-secretarian, as we might say. It's, yeah. It isn't just religion, it is a life now, and it's available to everyone. Without any cultural presuppositions no cultural. about yes, that. Yes, yeah. and we, we're so used to talking about that, that we have no idea what a incredible thing it was to go into a meeting with a group of people and find Greeks here and Jews there and people who are circumcised and people who aren't and and then over here is a Scythian. Scythian. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> now you know it's uh, and again we just don't pick up on that but a Scythian was well as I like to say a Scythian is the one when the barbarians saw the Scythians coming they said now there are barbarians. <laughs> you know. Because they're a mean bunch of people, and, and you know, that's, that's established. Uh, but it was sort of the bottom of the human barrel. Right. You know, right. the le uh, next level down was animals. <laughs> but here they are. They're sitting together, loving one another, ministering to one another, loving their people, people in their community. Mm -hmm. And it all comes out of one thing, and that is Christ is all yeah. in all. In all. And then John, in his revelation, yeah. projects that on That's right. That's right. into eternity. Right, because by the time you get to John, they have begun to understand who Jesus was. Yep. They, didn't, they couldn't get their minds around it. And that's why at the end of the, the last chapter of John, uh, John says, these things are written that you may know that Jesus is the Christ. Mm. And I always like to think of the Lone Ranger, you know, at the end of the old sequences. <laughs> Who was that masked man? <laughs> the Lone <laughs> Now that's I'm, Jesus. I, I, I'm sorry, that was before my time. Right? Oh, well. <laughs> you're, a, you're a spring chicken. <laughs> but um, uh, they didn't, but now by the time you get to the Revelation, they have got it. That's right. You've and got the community. When, when John sees Jesus there, the only appropriate response is to pass out. Yeah, exactly. And of course, he could never have come like that and done his work. Right. Because you can't make much progress when you're passed out. <laughs> and, um, so, and, and of course, John was, in, a, in essence, 
the pastor of these seven that's right. little churches. No, that's, that's right. And 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 so that may be the best thing for pastors is to well, pass out. So okay. <laughs> they need to be able to experience that at least to put yeah. them in the right yeah, posture. Yeah. Well, one of the things I love in this Dallas is this sense all through the Bible of God saying to us, I'm with you. I am with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. And then that haunting question, are you willing to be with me? Right. Yes. And so that's what this life... That's the great choice. And, and of course, that is where, how are we, how are we with him? Exactly. Well, that's a choice that we make. And then we learn through discipleship how to live in that. Right. And as we grow, we get a sense of something far beyond anything we know. And, you know, the wonderful word there in 1 John 3, Beloved, now we are called the children of God. And such we are. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. we don't yet know what we shall be. What we just know that when we see Him, we shall be as He is. Yeah. And yeah. that means we're getting in position to reign with Him forever and ever. This week, you've been encouraging us about crucifixion with Christ yes. as a good thing yes. to lead us into That's right. the greater life yes. of the kingdom of God in right. which we hear and obey the formation of the soul right. uh, leading us into a, a all-inclusive community of loving persons. Yes with yeah. God at the heart of that community as its prime sustainer right, and, and we, most glorious inhabitant. Yes. And we get the taste of that in daily life. Yep. That's and we don't get the whole deal. We couldn't stand it if we did. But we get to be people living now an eternal kind of life mm -hmm. wherever we are because we're really living from the kingdom of God. Now, Without getting too technical, I want to explore this idea of life. In the New Testament, there are two words for life, bios, mm -hmm. just physical life, mm -hmm. and zoe, mm -hmm. this eternal, uncreated life, right? Right. And so that's why it's possible to be physically alive, bios, right. and spiritually dead, mm -hmm. zoe. Now, can you... Just unpack this idea of the Zoe life of God that comes into the human being from the outside. Mm -hmm. That, and this is where I really hope you can help us, that has a principle of its own, this life. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean and how does that kind of work out for us? Okay, that's a great question. And let me start like this. Uh, life is uh, a process or activity uh, that is defined by how it is directed. What is it directed towards? Life is always purposive, uh, and there is a movement that is natural to the kind of life that we're talking about, whether it's a plant or a snail or a giraffe or a human being, uh, that uh, uh, has a direction and is a part of that direction. It has various parts to it, like a snail doesn't spend any time studying algebra. <laughs> human beings do. And that's a different part of life. Some human beings well, do. <laughs> right. But it's a, good, it's a human capacity. Yeah, right. right. Whereas the snail is sort of left out. <laughs> uh, okay. And that's characteristic of kinds of life. Now, the other thing that life does is it eats. Plants eat dirt, and they absorb light, and they do photosynthesis with that. And uh, we take in, and uh, if we are not provided 
what would nourish us for the kind of life that we have, mm -hmm. then we die. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, the human being is directed toward the governance of their world under God. That is a spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And that's how we're created. Uh, we lost that because being a spiritual life, it was grounded in choice and the ability to choose. The fundamental role of the human spirit is to simply trust God. And when you pull that away, you lose the nutrients that are necessary for human beings to flourish. Just like if you take sunlight away from a cabbage plant. Right. Not much going to come of that. Um, so the human being has in it a kind of life that derives from its capacity to draw on God as the principle that sustains it, mm -hmm. gives its direction power, mm -hmm. and keeps the direction right. right. When we withdraw from God, we turn back on ourselves and we try to make God out of ourselves. And the pickings there are pretty slim, <laughs> <laughs> you know, quite frankly. And so human life does not go well. And you get the story in Romans 1 about the degeneration that comes as the human being turns back on its own body and tries to draw from that the nutrition that will enable it to flourish. This is a, so important for us to understand what goes on in our world today. Mm -hmm. So then now the person who is a disciple of Jesus has reestablished the connection with God through Christ. Right. And that's where, of course, God with us has the initiative on God's side. Right. But he's willing and he makes himself available. And the new, the, the, the new birth, which of course is actually the birth from above, it's not just a new one. It's located in a certain source and that above is where the kingdom of God is. So from the outside comes in life, right. reestablished life, right. the connection. The word of the Spirit, word and the Spirit comes in, and the response is to receive it. I like to think of these wonderful refueling planes so that uh, you, they trail a, a hose out back of them, and the plane comes up, and that's us. <laughs> and, then, uh, and we're taking in fuel from God. Now this life that comes in then is indestructible. Indestructible. Right? And, and that's one of the reasons that the resurrection of Jesus meant so much. Absolutely. Is that the disciples saw right. that this life can't be destroyed. Absolutely it's, right. It keeps on. Uh, in effect, uh, Jesus on the cross is saying, hit me with your best shot. <laughs> And I live beyond and it. And I'll live, live, live beyond it. So the disciples knew then that they were possessors right. or right. participators maybe right. in a life that will go on forever and that will accomplish it, its purposes. That's right. And its, and its two contemporary manifestations are always in transformation of character and power mm. to accomplish what is good. Mm. Now that the power to accomplish what is good that was our original charter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we can't do it if we don't have the life, the life. that is life indeed. Life. Okay. Now when we have that, then we grow in our capacity to do that mm -hmm. as our character becomes more capable of right. bearing the power. And that's part of the reasons for spiritual disciplines right. to, to help yeah. uh, train that's right, and righteousness. it's very important here to understand that that's a continuation of God's provision for us to find ways to deal with Him at an appropriate distance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, see, the disciplines are not themselves <coughs> um, holy works. Right. They are avenues into the presence of God. Yeah. And uh, you like to use that word, uh, means of grace, and mm -hmm. that's what it is, a, a discipline you go into solitude or silence. Well, that's something you can do, but it's not for its own sake. It's to be receptive. Exactly. I mean, God. I like, you know, Paul's words to Timothy, exercise yourself yes. into godliness. Yes. And that word exorcizo right. has the Greek gymnasium, its background. Mm -hmm. So the idea of training. Yes. 
uh, like the athletes would train. That's right. And somebody was asking the question of what discipline is appropriate. Well, it's like an athlete that is, uh, if, if you're a gymnast and you're good at the parallel bars, right. but you're not good at the floor exercise. That's absolutely right. That's... You got to get to the floor exercise. Yes. And, and, uh, and another word, uh, New Testament word, is paideia, which has uh, also a classic background right. to it. It refers, paideia refers more to the holistic development of the whole person. Right. But of course you can't do that unless you're developing the parts. And so you need both gymnazo and paideia. And God gives us teachings about how to enter into that and go to school to Jesus, be his student, and that's the whole, uh, that's where our word piety comes from. Oh, it, the it, it the does, whole yeah. life being formed in that's a new right. way. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, now then that whole life requires that be, we be with one another. And mm. so uh, that keeps us out. You know, yeah. you probably hear the same thing I do when you, in some, some quarters when you bring up spiritual disciplines, people will say, oh, privatization. <laughs> you know, well, of course, they don't know what they're talking about because yeah. what what the spiritual disciplines do is they teach you how to love with power, yeah. and that is communal from the start to the end, and so it isn't privatization at all. You turn this person loose out here; they're operating in a bank or in a taco stand or whatever, and that's where the power of character uh, and the presence of God comes through. Now, I want to turn our thinking a little bit more specifically to hearing God, mm -hmm. and particularly your teaching here in this book um, on, uh, on the way we come to understand the voice of God mm -hmm. um, and, and the quality of the voice of God, right. the spirit of the voice of God, and, and the mm -hmm. content. And... And that sense of the spirit, you know, God draws and encourages, Satan pushes and condemns. Right. <laughs> and we can learn the difference. Yes, indeed. And so then we learn the voice of God, and as you put it, in the still small voice. And you make a statement in here about the, uh, uh, the greater the expression <laughs> the more immature that yeah. is, the the as you develop in maturity, mm -hmm. you don't need. It's yeah, like in right. my mind, I think of uh, you know a horse that has learned a neck rein. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take much mm -hmm. at all to yeah, turn. That's right. I mean, that's right. If Sometimes just leaning will is enough. Right. If people have visions and dreams, I mean that's wonderful. But it isn't necessarily a compliment. No, it isn't. Uh, it's a grace in this uh -huh. respect that that is, an, that is another aspect of God's fine tuning on this issue of distance. Right. Because the, the dramatic cases um, address the distance that is there in, in the sense of. Uh, grabbing someone who might never recognize the still small voice if it came. Yep. But also the meaning is not so clear that the person is unable to respond to it. Right. Uh, and I think this is so important to understand and it does stand out in that passage in Numbers uh, where Aaron and Miriam get in trouble with God because of their jealousy of Moses. And I think that's one of the most important passages mm. in coming to understand the voice because God just explains his policy. And it starts out by saying something very important, that Moses is the most humble, humble man on yeah. earth. And wow, you that's know, a character formation absolutely that right. opens the way. Right. And, and that also, you know, is an, such an illustration of the thing that turns up both in Peter and James in the New Testament, where it says, God resists the proud. Mm. Well, here's old Miriam and yep. Aaron, Aaron, and they're getting resisted. Mm. But he gives grace to the humble. And to he says, humble. now, 
My servant Moses is not like other people, yeah. other prophets. Uh, the ordinary prophet will have a dream or a vision or something of that sort, but I just talk to Moses. Yeah. And he talks to me. Yeah. And that's the ideal condition. Now the but thing God, I but God doesn't leave us alone if we can't do that. Right. And he so stays, some, that's right. And that was the thing, the teaching of Elijah. I yes. mean, after that, that incredible experience with the prophets of Baal, mm -hmm. which had plenty of fireworks to yes. it. Yes. And and then of course he, right. he skedaddles and that whole story, wanting to die. Under yeah, the broom tree and right. getting over to the cave. Yeah, a lot of self, a lot of self deception. Because if he <laughs> wanted to die, he could have just stayed there and let Jezebel do he, it. <laughs> <laughs> but the passage that I find so interesting when he gets to the cave, yeah. and I think often, you know, when, sometimes when we go through it, mm -hmm. that uh, we want to say, "Move over, Elijah. Mm -hmm. Let me come and pout in right. the cave with yeah. you." But then God doesn't leave him there, uh, but takes him out of the cave. That's right. And God says, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Mm -hmm. Now that, that passage mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. uh, 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 Sinai in right. its background. Yes, indeed. When God passed by. And and scared him course, to death. Yeah, plenty of fireworks. <laughs> So Elijah was looking mm -hmm. for the, the fireworks. Well, he was good at fireworks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but not much more, to but, tell you the truth. Right. I mean, right. Uh, he's, he's such a fascinating thing to study. And I think the story there about how when that little voice comes, mm -hmm. he wraps his face in his mantle. I think that's Elijah realizing what he didn't have. Yeah. And of course, this was the end of his ministry. And from there, he went to ordain Elisha. Right. And I mean, there were some other things that happened after that, but basically, that was the end of the fireworks. It was, it was over. And it's very instructive to us, again, in this whole issue of God with us. And the speaking is absolutely essential to that. Mm -hmm. And of course it comes in many ways. The Bible is a constant speaking to us where we can go to seek the Word of God. Uh, it's kind of like the, the Word uh, at a permanent address, whereas Israel was a permanent address for God's kingdom at one time. The Bible as a form of God's presence in the world, it's speaking, uh, and we need to go beyond the sacred page, as the mm -hmm. song says, mm -hmm. beyond the sacred page. We seek thee, Lord, our spirit pants for thee, the living God. And that's, that's the point where the speaking goes on. But even though that was the end of Elijah's earthly ministry, it wasn't the end. Yes. Because he ends yeah. up on another mountain. Yeah, with, he does. Uh, 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 and Jesus he gets, and the disciples and go he up. And he gets a ride in a fiery chariot. <laughs> Well, his exit. Yep. But then even beyond that, yeah. what we call the Mount of Transfiguration, oh, yes. he Absolutely. ends up Elijah and Moses mm -hmm. and Jesus. So then we go to Jesus as the ultimate example of God moving with us. Yes, that's right. And I'm uh, so touched by what they were talking about. <laughs> they were talking about his death. Yeah, yeah. And I think that... Uh, I think that they were encouraging him. Mm. And, uh, you know, they never found Moses' body. And I have a feeling that uh, it wasn't left on earth. Mm. And there's some indications, of course, about the angel contend contending with Satan mm -hmm. to get his body. And if mm -hmm. Satan had got his body, I'm sure there would still be a statue of Moses somewhere <laughs> where they worship him. <laughs> But it's so important to get out of that. Same way with Elijah. And Eli exactly. Yeah. And, and Jesus himself. And I mean, imagine what it would be like if someone had the body of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or even the grave clothes or something. Oh, like yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, and so these are, but these are important things about how God is with us yeah. to draw us into the spiritual world fully. Mm -hmm. and to understand its reality, and of course to know that the physical world doesn't disappear. Yep. It's still there, but now 
we have moved into a mode of life with God where we're not under the limitations yeah. that are imposed by matter. And Jesus, you remember, he said, well, you know, if I don't go away, the Spirit can't come. Right. So, um, so we can move into that life. That's right. Well, Moses and Elijah encouraging Jesus mm -hmm. about his death. This week, you've been encouraging us about crucifixion with Christ. Yes. As a good thing, yes, to lead us into that's right the greater life yes. of the kingdom of God, in right. which we hear and obey the formation of the soul, right, uh, leading us into a a all inclusive community of loving persons, yes, with yeah. God at the heart of that community as its prime sustainer right. and, and we, most glorious in heaven. Yes. And we get the taste of that in daily life. Yep. That's and we don't get the whole deal. We couldn't stand it if we did. But we get to be people living now an eternal kind of life mm -hmm. wherever we are because we're really living from the kingdom of God. And so that death is merely a minor transition Yes, from Jesus, this life to greater life. Jesus said you wouldn't experience it. <laughs> yeah. uh, very interesting thing. And that's a big part of the New Testament message. Mm -hmm. And you remember Paul uh, even says in 2 Timothy 1, 10, that he ab Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the yeah. gospel. Yeah. That's kingdom living. That's right. eternal living. And I think we should really emphasize that, Richard, because mm -hmm. so many of our folks are still deeply troubled about dying and death. Yeah, yeah. And, and we want to say, no, that'll, it will, it will uh, make a difference to the people who are left here. Yeah. But you're not going to be here. Right. You know. You will go on. You are out of here. And your experience, as you know it now, especially as you know it living in the kingdom of God, will conti be continuous through the event which from this side looks like dying, but... Uh, your experience will go on. I don't think uh, Lazarus, as he was at that banquet, you know, in mm -hmm. Abraham's bosom, was thinking about death. Right? <laughs> and I actually think a good way of saying it is probably you won't even know you've died until later. Right. <laughs> because you've stepped beyond time. That's right. right. Now, uh, that's the eternal life. However, We've run out of time, so we have to stop. Eternity keeps on. That's right. <laughs>